I'm uh, Ed Lewis, Thomas Hunt Morgan Professor of Biology, Emeritus actually, but active. And uh, my serial number is 0880582, <laughs> American Air Force. Ed, why don't we start at the beginning uh, with your birth and childhood in Pennsylvania? Well, I was born in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, which is uh, on the Susquehanna River. Father was a watchmaker. I came from a very poor family because it was uh, at a period of time when my father had uh, actually lost his job during the Depression. And, um, but my parents were able to look after us even in spite of floods and Depression years. And in Wilkes-Barre, we had a, a very fine library, uh, the Oosterhout Library, which I used a lot looking up books on how to make aquariums. And, and one day I found a book by Jennings which explained about fruit flies. And I was hooked from then on. Somehow we had to be able to work with flies. Actually, that's a long story, but what happened was they also had Science Magazine. And while uh, I was looking around, I noticed in one of the issues that you could buy Drosophila cultures from a professor at Purdue University. So for a dollar, I think I got an, uh, put through an order of one or two of these strains, which we got. Novitsky and I, a friend of mine in high school, started this probably when we were juniors in high school. So that's how it all started. Did you get any good experiments done in high school? We did quite a lot of experiments because the, uh, the biology teacher was the football coach. And he let us do anything we wanted to. He didn't know any genetics, of course. But we had a modern lab. And at night, we used to come back and work on fruit flies. And we tried various media. That was a little bit of a problem, get, keeping the molds out. But, and Novitsky corresponded with Bridges, who was at Caltech, and got some more f strains of flies that way that were free, of course. <laughs> so, and he found one day a mutant with a spread wings, which called held out, which is one of the most famous of all of mutants that, that have ever been found, namely what Gelbart called decapentaplegic. He renamed the mutant. And here's a mutant that's got applications now to human uh, growth of bones and so on. It's quite an amazing story, all found in the high school at, where we grew up. Did you do experiments at home also? When I was at, I went to, First, I went to Bucknell for a year on a music scholarship. Mm -hmm. And that was no place to study genetics. So I looked around and found that Minnesota had the lowest out-of-state residency fee of any university, state university in the country. It was about $25 a year or a term, I can't remember. Berkeley might have been a little cheaper, but it was too far away. And so uh, I went to uh, Minnesota. And there I got started working on the flies, actually star a mutation of the eye that, that Stern had found, and a mutant asteroid, as I named it, that Novitsky found. I had been playing around with these in, in the lab of genetics that was run by uh, Clarence Oliver at Minnesota. And it was so exciting that I took the flies home during the summer uh, and worked on them and found an act actually a reversion of the, as we called it then, that was actually the start of the whole work that I ended up with by thorax and everything else. And your mother put up with that? Yes, we, she put up with snakes that I kept in the bedroom and all kinds of animals that I kept. Okay. So it was biology right from the beginning? Yes, early stage. Now you said you're working in a genetics lab with Oliver at the yes. University of Minnesota, but your degree is in biostatistics. Yes, that's an interesting story. The chairman of the division there said that you had to be very cultured and uh, you must take a course in English furniture, which I hadn't done. And uh, I did tell him I was playing in the symphony uh, there. The university had its own symphony. And uh, I think he was a little shocked to think that anybody who was in zoology might be actually have some artistic tal talent, I guess. But uh, uh, I was so disgusted with his requirements that I uh, went to the biostatistics department which had never had a student before in that field. And so it was very easy to get a, a course outlined that would complete the degree. And I, so I was able to get out of there 
in two years. Not that it wasn't a great place. It was a great place, but I wanted to get on to graduate work. So you didn't have any money anyway, so it was the way to, there you could get a fellowship as, as, as a graduate student in those days. Did you work to earn your way through college? Yes, I did several things. I would, it, during the, mainly during the off seasons, uh, that is during the Christmas holidays, I would work in the hospital. And I had an NYA, that was National Youth Administration uh, grant that uh, allowed, that was a, a wonderful thing at the time because it was in the height of the depression and the students didn't have any money, but you could earn money by working in some professor's lab. One, one thing that I did was take care of a rat colony that was being used actually to study uh, intelligence in rats, training them and so on. But even more interesting was a study in biostatistics department that I did, with, which was to study the uh, menstrual history of all the girls going to the University of Minnesota. They, they had to tabulate the, the length of the period on a calendar, and then they gave it to the woman who in, in biostatistics who was making a study of this. It was a very interesting piece of work because the variability was absolutely enormous. At any rate, that was another a kind of job that I took on. But I didn't earn a lot of money, but just enough to get by. My brother was a great influence in my, in my life. He was working at the time and helped me with my expenses. So that was made it possible for me to complete my college education. And so then you decided to go on to graduate school? Did, did you apply yeah. to graduate uh, school? Is that how it was I, done? Or? I did. By the way, Mel Green was a graduate student at the time I was an undergraduate in Minnesota in Clarence Oliver's lab. Oliver was a wonderful man. He, he allowed you complete freedom. He was very well trained by Muller, very good scientist. And at uh, any rate, he uh, uh, thought I ought to go to Texas for graduate work because he'd gone to Texas. And, uh, but he didn't insist on it. And one professor who uh, was a protozoologist said, don't go to Caltech, those people have all been sent out there to die. <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, I knew Ed Nowitzki, who had come here, and he was very happy here, so, uh, and under his uh, advice, uh, uh, I came to Caltech in preference to Texas. I really didn't want to go to Texas. <laughs> anyway, so it was a very good decision um, to have made. So they accepted you, gave you a fellowship, I suppose? And it seemed to be automatic. I don't remember signing anything. I probably filled a form out, and it was no problem. But and you took the train or the bus and came, came out to I Caltech was, in what year? I think it was the El Capitan was the train that the, the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe had at that time. It was a lot of fun traveling on that. You stayed up, I think, two nights or so getting there. But at any rate. So what year did you arrive here? 39, 1939. August 39. So. Immediately started working in the lab, or were there courses? Yes, I think I brought probably some flies along, and I worked with Sturdivant, told him what I wanted to do, and he didn't want to interfere. It was typical of that group then that if you had your own project, that was fine, and see how far you could get with it. And so I, I was uh, able to start work on the project I'd started at Minnesota on these eye mutant star and asteroids, so I started right away. So what was the staff at Caltech like at that time? Morgan was chairman, Sturdivant was of course there. When I came, Morgan was, uh, had relinquished it to a committee of three people. It was Sturdivant, Hagenschmidt, and I believe Borsuk. And Hagenschmidt was very good at the financial things. Sturdivant, I don't think, was very good at administration. And so probably Hagenschmidt really ran the place with maybe Borsak had some influence. Uh, Morgan was getting, uh, I would say, tired as he was no longer interested in genetics and he'd build up the department and it was probably he had he'd already been here about 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. so. so Sturdivant was on the faculty. Uh, did you ever meet Bridges? Never met Bridges, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, he uh, died the winter before um, I came, 38. Mm. Uh, I think. So I always regretted that because he was 
a, quite a character, I understand. And he did an enormous amount for genetics, uh, uh, keeping the stocks. And in fact, he had stocks that he'd built up that allowed me to look at, at the various pseudolelic genes that we, I worked on, especially by thorax and stubble. Uh, wonderful stocks that would have required a lot of work to develop. He presumably worked himself on those, but he also had Edith Wallace who helped mm -hmm. build those stocks. And so the Drosophila group at that time was just Sturdivant and Dobzhansky, perhaps? Dobzhansky was there, oh yeah. yes, very active in population genetics. St Sterling Emerson, uh, Emerson was yeah. there and was now switching more to, his main interest was plant materials. And, but he had worked with uh, Sturdivant and with uh, Beetle on flies. They worked a lot on triploids. So that was the group, and across the hall was Albert Tyler in embryology, and uh, so we would take courses with him to um, sea urchin, sperm, and things like that. So you got started again with star and asteroid as a yes, graduate project. Yes, I started project. that. And, uh, I, I, and, and pseudo alleles. Right. What's, what's the deal? The idea that really started it all was the idea that maybe you could split a gene by taking two different forms of the gene, which we call alleles, and getting them to undergo crossing over. Well, uh, I never liked that. Somehow, multiple allelism set progress back in genetics for many, many years, in my opinion, because the concept was a gene could do almost anything and you could explain any interaction between two mutants uh, that seemed to, to be close uh, on the chromosome by this hypothesis. We didn't think of it as splitting the gene. We thought of it as two genes that could be separated by crossing over. And I didn't know until I came here that people like uh, Helen Redfield, wife of, of Schultz, had found that if you put inversions in all the chromosomes except one arm, say, you greatly increase crossing over. So, so I built all the stocks that filled all the chromosomes but 2L with inversions, and sure enough, I got a fourfold increase in crossing over in the star region, something like that. And that made it possible to get these rare crossovers that could be shown to be ordered and that indicated that the two mutants that I found, they were originally called star and star recessive because that was the way you dealt with these. You had to call them recessive alleles see, of the same gene. But as soon as I could separate them, I called it asteroid. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the recessive allele I called asteroid. Nowadays, we know it's more complicated, probably. They're not really separate genes, but I think the asteroid will eventually turn out to be some kind of enhancer region, and star may be the actual coding region of the gene. But we still don't know what's going on there. But that was a great deal of fun because I found out that the genes were located in a little doublet of the salivary gland chromosomes. And these doublets, Bridges said, look, those are probably duplications. So when I found that, I thought I had cytological proof that these things were, were uh, duplicate genes. Of course, it's probably all wrong because the doublets may not be duplications at all. It's just an artifact. So, it's, it's rather nice, though. I might have given up, although I doubt it. <laughs> and so you had star, dominant eye color mutant, or yes. dominant eye right. morphology mutant, yes. asteroid, recessive, very similar mutant phenotype. Right. Uh, what was the point of getting the recombination, just to see if it could be done? I think it was to really test the idea of whether there were two genes or not. Uh -huh, yeah. I could say Brid Bridges' idea was mm -hmm. that looking at the salivaries, he thought he saw duplications around that were naturally occurring in the species. If so, that would explain how these multiple allelic series uh, got to be complicated. They were actually two genes or three genes. Uh, so that you're, was a, you're proving that they we were, were two separate right. genes because right. genes had, uh, if, and, if they recombined, they had to be in two different genes, right. according to the doctorate at the time. Yes, and, yeah. and I think the other thing is that in the back of your mind, that's a way you evolve new genes mm -hmm. from old genes. And that idea was not very uh, common, and in fact, not even accepted very much. Nobody, nobody seemed to think much about why uh, you could get new genes. But um, tandem duplication turns out, even though Sturdivant first found this with Barr, turned out to be the most logical way to build up 
an increase in gene number mm -hmm. besides just doubling the chromosome number, which you can't yeah. keep on doing. Uh, in animals. What about the cis-trans test? Oh, that was a great deal of fun because I worked very hard to get the double mutant, which is necessary before you can perform the test, which essentially put mutant A over mutant B, which we call the trans, and then you want to get A, B in the same chromosome and put it over wild type. Of course, that had been done for unlinked or closely uh, uh, linked genes by uh, early workers, they called it coupling and repulsion. It was repulsion if it was A over B and coupling if it was AB over plus. And they invented uh, those terms, but Haldane came along and said, let's call cis the double mutant over plus and trans A over B, which is analogous to the structural chemist definitions of cis and trans. So, so uh, we didn't actually call it that. We called it pseudoallelism for a long time. Finally. We called it the cis-trans test. That is, they were and two different genes because they could recombine, but it, yes. when they were in cis over wild type, you got a wild type, where in the case of star yes. asteroid over plus, it looked just like star, right. while star plus over plus asteroid had a stronger phenotype. Very strong, yes. Yeah. So it was very exciting to see that you had something that you worked very hard to get, namely the double mutant, and then when you got it, it was not what some people would have predicted it would have been like the A over B, that is, it would be AB over plus would be the same. That is, it would have had very small eyes, which is what star over asteroid had. So at any rate, it, uh, it was pretty clear it was going to be nearly the same as star. Mm -hmm. And so that, that was a lot of fun. It's really great when you finally get a result that seems to fit some ideas. I started working, this was after the after I came back after the war on two other series where there was a stubble and stubloid case. And that was even more exciting because, because the double mutant stubble and stubloid is wild type, whereas stubble over stubble has very tiny bristles. So it was a similar phenomenon, but again with different uh, phenotypes, but tremendously different phenotypes between the cis and the trans forms. And so of course, so, Benzer was working on that yeah. later on with, with Phage, and, and he uh, gave the nice name Cistron to these genes that, that all seem to fit into one category of one gene by one test, but by recombination could be separated. By textbook genetics, then, you have a situation where you have two separate genes, A and B. AB over plus, if they're recessive, would be wild type. A plus over plus B would also be wild type if they're different genes, a complementation test. But if they're alleles of the same gene, then A plus over plus A prime being an allele of A yes. would give you a mutant phenotype. But we saw it was more complicated than that, almost like the position effect in Barr, right? Yes, uh, uh, very much different because the theory would be that the, uh, both genotypes would look alike. So you began to see interactions between right. closely linked Pretty, genes. Yes. And we knew about position effects uh, because they had been found by the bar, as you mentioned, by Sturdivant, although it's a little different kind of uh, yes, it, yes, it is. position effect. And of course, Muller found the wonderfully variegated types of position effects. So we knew all that. And so it, it came, became clear that the cis-trans effect was just another kind of position effect. So that wasn't a wholly new f uh, idea, but it position effect fitted the result that we got. Mm -hmm. So we could say that, and what I thought of is that there were, genes were proteins, everybody said that. You had to, the biochemist told you they're proteins, so we had figured out that there was a, a sequence of biochemical steps going on in the chromosome and things were diffusing across and you could explain everything with that. It's only when the wild type alleles are together that the, the synthesis of the, uh, the steps that are involved, the, the, the synthetic steps can be carried out effectively. When they're in opposite chromosomes, they can't and so on. Effects like transvection and so on only became puzzling after it became clear that genes weren't proteins. Yes. Uh, that. It was quite a different matter then. We, we started inventing new ideas. It was like the operon, mm -hmm. and, uh, which had, to which uh, the, there is some analogy. But, but, but again, that wasn't yeah. sufficient because they didn't 
there was no evidence for a polycystronic message for, for our theory. Mm -hmm. No, you were so, definitely finding something new, yeah, but, you yeah. were only, but it only became surprising after you found out the genes were not proteins that could uh, do a series of reactions on a single chromosome. Right. Maybe we should get back to a temporal sequence, though. So you finished your PhD with a star and asteroid work as a student of Sturtevant's. Right. And uh, then the work got disrupted. Yes, oh yes. Well, we were lucky as graduate students not to be drafted as soon as we went, entered World War, World War II. Pearl Harbor was bombed December, December 41. 41, and we didn't finish until June of 42. So, which was six months or so. Fortunately, we could get deferred and uh, could finish. But then the choice was you could either take a quickie course and become an MD, or you could uh, take a course in meteorology, which we had here at Caltech, or S Signal Corps. And I decided to take the meteorology because I was no good at electricity. And so uh, I studied. Uh, meteorology here for almost a year and then at the end of that went over to UCLA and got a diploma in oceanography ended up in the Pacific and Hawaii and finally Okinawa it was quite an interesting experience it was in in Okinawa I was the staff weather officer for the 10th army but I had been assigned to the navy I was actually in the air force attached to the 10th army and assigned to the navy because they had the weather information. So I lived aboard one of the big command ships and sent the weather information ashore. At any rate, that went on for a couple of years, uh, well, a year. Uh, and then I came back after that and started up again here because Millikan had promised me a job here. So <laughs> Meaning that Sturdivant had told Millikan, tell him that he should come back. So uh, uh, Millikan asked me one day to come over and. And I, he said, the war isn't going to last forever. When it's over, come back. And that was the way they hand, handled new appointments then. You didn't <laughs> have to have 15 letters of recommendation, which was probably a mistake. But anyway, I got back. <laughs> I got back. <laughs> you without, slipped under the wire. Yeah, those are different times. So the war's over. You're back at Caltech, and you're establishing in your own lab. Where did they put you? Oh, I was in Kirkhoff, 311 Kirkhoff. Uh, not as big a room as I'd had as a graduate student, but it was adequate. And uh, so, so I started right up again. And, and I actually had a lot of work to do uh, in getting the stockroom organized. Uh, the Drosophila stockroom, of course, was the, along with Cold Spring Harbor, the leading place for stock collections. By the way, while I was a meteorologist, I would come over to biology and uh, and check up on what was going on in genetics. <laughs> but at any rate, I did have a lot of stock. In addition to helping in the genetics course, I did a lot towards getting the stock center here organized and so on. That Bridges, of course, had started. Mm -hmm. And had gone downhill over the years. Somewhat, he, yes. Yeah. And especially there was no good fly food during the war, World War II. So you started your own lab. Did you get students, postdocs, anything of that sort? I had. Um, or was it all just Yes, you? well, I remember Sturdivant would say that we were sharing Dan Lindsley. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we shared a couple of students, as he put it. I think I had a, a Chinese student, though, uh, you, uh, capital Y-U, uh, who uh, did some very nice cytology uh, on uh, mutations that he'd induced. He was inducing... Uh, X-ray mutations, and he found Antennapedia U, uh, named after him, uh, one of the strongest alleles ever found of Antennapedia, and it was named here, first named here, because Sturdivant knew about these and knew it wasn't the same as the Aristopedia mutations. Uh, a French Le Calais had said it was, a, he had found one earlier, actually, so, somewhat earlier, and called it dominant Aristopedia, which it was not, but uh, was the first antennapedia leo, but Hughes straightened this matter out, and he did the cytology of that. And uh, he, when he finished, uh, went back to China, but was not allowed ever to practice genetics because the, the Lysenkoism was rampant in China. He died only a year or so ago. So, so he, he was, was the first student. Your I, first student. Yes. So you'd finished with Star and Asteroid. You did some work with Stubble and Stubbeloid. When did Bythorax start? 
Well, I was working rather quickly on building stocks, I think, for all, for not only the star and ast continuing star and asteroid, but to work on stubble, stubbloid end by thorax and even spineless, because they're all closely linked, and it was just perfect to have closely linked markers that you need to have when you study crossing over between closely linked genes. So everything was ideal. Well, I did spend a year in England, uh, only a year or so after I came back, mm -hmm. on a Rockefeller Fellowship. And uh, that was sort of interesting, because one day Beetle came into the lab and said, he came along with Pomerat, who was one of the U Rockefeller Foundation people who had come out to the West Coast. And he said, how would you like to go to uh, Cambridge for a year, uh, a sabbatical? And I said, uh, I wasn't too enth enthusiastic, but I, I thought, well, OK. It turned out we were expecting our first child uh, about the time they wanted us to go there. So I couldn't say that. We weren't too sure. But at any rate, uh, that explained my reticence about this. But in those days, you could get a fellowship uh, that way. They just uh, ask you, how would you like a fellowship <laughs> to go abroad? So I did go, in the, in, and we had a wonderful year. And the reason I bring it up is that there was a, I met there a, a geneticist, Bateman, who had found a mutant microcephalus. And microcephalus was a tiny eye mutation that was the perfect marker to be at the right of either bithorax or stubloid. It made a lot of things possible that we could, would have had trouble with otherwise. So you're thinking about looking at a, the pseudo-allelic series at bithorax. You right. needed flanking markers, right. but you didn't have them until after the trip to Cambridge. For the right end, right. Mm -hmm. That's correct. There was another one, Stripe, which would have been far too far away and would have required much more work. It was hard enough to do these experiments anyway. I loaded everything with inversions, and that means a lot of stock building. It took probably a year or so to get all these things going. And I published the results in the Cold Spring Harbor Symposium about the stubble stubloid case and the bithorax cases. So that was a, that was a great time when you could uh, you just use a meeting like Cold Spring Harbor to present all the stuff and uh, encourage you to write it up and so on. So your choice of bithorax was not because the, of the homeotic phenotypes and not because of developmental interest, but because it represented a series of pseudo-alleles where exactly. you had That's closely exactly flanking right. markers. People think that we were interested in development. We had no interest in development at all. Uh, it, you were not supposed to work on Drosophila. It was the worst organism for embryology that existed practically, but it did have good genetics. So we were supposed to do genetics and let the embryologists do the embryology. Turns out, of course, it's about the best organism for embryology that, was, that could ever have been invented. Essentially a l linear embryo instead of a ball of junk that, uh, that we are made of when we start out. So the idea was allelic series, and there were multiple pseudo-alleles in bithorax, so it was more complicated than the others. And it was still pressing the idea that uh, there would be duplicate genes as Bridges had visualized, and that, that these fitted the bill as complex, multiple allelic series. Well, right. darn it, they weren't going to be multiple allelic series in our hands. And uh, at least they separate into components that we now, I think, recognize as not separate genes usually, but these enhancer elements, which are enormous. They're as big as genes, these enhancers, in the, in the case of bithorax. Huge areas that act as enhancers that don't code for anything, although some of them code for RNAs. So that, that's an exciting field. We still don't know much about whether RNAs have a lot to do with this system that we're working on. The bithorax system. So you were able to do the cis-trans test with UBX and BX34E, yes. I guess, and, uh, right. and found some surprising pairing-dependent effects. Yeah, well, that was really exciting. If you look at A over B, you'd like to look at it when they're paired, as they are in Drosophila, the chromosomes, or when they're not paired, which you can accomplish by putting in a chromosomal rearrangement. So he x-rayed, sure enough, when you get a rearrangement that upsets pairing in the right arm of the third chromosome where these genes are, the phenotype dramatically changes. And the reason is that bithorax is very unusual in that when you knock out the gene, you get an enormous amount of overgrowth of tissue. 
Usually when you knock out a gene, you lose something. Here, you gain a whole thorax that was never there mm. in, in, except in ancient ancestors. So it was a spectacular result. And it led to uh, uh, actually looking into uh, whether neutrons produce <laughs> rearrangements according to a law of linear law, which would be predicted physically, or whether they produce an, the way x-rays do with a power law, as, since two hits are required. So that, that was a long story, too, because as soon as I found this effect, uh, I it saw that it had relevance to the testing of bombs at that time. So because they were worried about how much genetic damage you'd get from neutrons. Clarence Oliver had studied a lot of rearrangement uh, induction by, uh, uh, he had studied rearrangement induction from x-rays, and Muller had too, and there it was a power function, but the theory was that neutrons might do it linearly, and Muller had little evidence for it, but I was able to get a lot more by using this uh, transvection test that I invented. So uh, it turned out that the ideal way to do this was to get uh, some neutrons from a pile, it was at University of Chicago, might have been one of the very original piles, or to, uh, I shouldn't say or, and to take some flies to Las Vegas where you could put them out where they were testing bombs. So both things were done, actually. I went to Argonne National Lab and, and had the flies treated with neutrons from one of their uh, rather primitive react reactors. And then Beetle took the flies to uh, Las Vegas and, and carried them there to put them out when they blew up one of these atomic weapons. And uh, actually, I couldn't get there because I was considered a radical and couldn't get cleared to go there, although I, during the war I'd been cleared for the super top secret work when I was a meteorologist. At any rate, I never, I've never known what quite why, but I did play chess one time with a, a man who was here at Caltech, Sidney Weinbaum, who went to prison because of the uh, House on American Activities pe pe people. Uh, I think he might have been a communist, maybe he was, but he wouldn't answer questions or something like that, so they put him in prison. And I imagined later on that I was probably being watched by the FBI going to play chess with this terrible man who must have been a communist and so on. That was a terrible period, of course. It resulted in your being unable to take your own flies <laughs> yeah, to the bomb site. And I, probably, actually, a, probably a good thing. It was a good thing in a way because... After what you found out about neutron yeah, mutagenesis. Right. Because Beetle came back and he said they'd gotten 10R. Well, frankly, I didn't want to get 10R. I was a young man, <laughs> and I wouldn't have wanted to get 10R, but it increased your chance of cancer a little bit. But at any rate, it was, uh, those were interesting times. So, so you took some of the flies to Argonne for neutron irradiation. You once told me you slept on the reactor. Is that yes, right? I, was, I don't know what kind of dose I got. I had film badges, but I, I should have insisted to know what the dose was that I got. But it turned out that the housing they had was, was very primitive, just wooden uh, beds, uh, uh, wooden uh, cots uh, that were in an area that was directly above this reactor. So I don't know how much dose he got. It was absolutely ridiculous. So, so you were but sleeping on a reactor, and George <laughs> Beetle was taking your flies out yeah. and putting them in front of a mushroom cloud. Right, right. As what must have been the first and maybe the last example of mutagenesis by atomic bomb. The material yes. and methods is great. What I should also add is that I had to publish this stuff, so the transvection, I think, first got published as part of this uh, experiment, so that I used not only the early x-ray work that I'd done, but I could use the neutron data that I collected in this paper. So this paper in the American Naturalist uh, is sort of a fun paper in that sense. But it, uh, the, the neutron effect is, is quite remarkable. It's apparently the neutrons, when they uh, decay, they make a hydrogen nucleus that tears through the whole nucleus of the sperm and can rep, rip several chromosomes apart. And the, the breaks stay open in sperm, and so they can reshuffle. So it's a one-hit phenomenon to make a translocation. It was quite amazing. It was very important because they were worried about how much of the atomic bomb radiation in Japan would be neutron radiation that would produce the cancers that were showing up. So Actually, it's a small component uh, 
the gamma ray is the important one in the atomic explosion. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, you're working in the lab on bithorax and finding new uh, uh, genetic loci that right. are separable by recombination from UBX and right. BX and right. things like PBX and CBX, right. for which you're well known. And right. on the other hand, you started a second career in radiation mutagenesis as a result, yeah. I guess, of not only oh. the things that you learned in biostatistics, but right. these bomb tests. Well, what actually happened was I used to eat lunch at the Athenaeum, and still do uh, for lunch, where you'd meet with other faculty members. And I started that even, I think, when I was an instructor. But at any rate, uh, one day I, I found out the physicists thought there was a threshold. There had to be a threshold for genetic effects, especially for cancer. So I decided to look into this. And there'd already been knowledge that radiologists are, seem to have more leukemia uh, cases than we'd expect. Uh, and uh, there were x-ray burns that people knew about. So there was already an indication you got cancer from radiation, but there was no quantitation at all of this. This was 1957, and it was just at that time that, that, uh, that the physicists here were saying, don't worry about the fallout that we were producing in Nevada from these bomb tests. Just at that time, some dose estimates were being made and I took the dose response curves, uh, re dose in relation to distance, and converted them into probable absorbed doses for the people who were at different distances. So I worked up the data into three or four zones with an average dose per zone. And if you plotted the number of leukemia cases per zone, it, it was linear. It was beautifully linear. So no I threshold, <laughs> no dose rate and effect. Of course, they were all very mm -hmm. high doses. So mm -hmm. I hadn't proven anything, they said, because these were high doses. Uh, they mm -hmm. went down probably to 50R was about the lowest you could find any evidence at that time, except for some animal work where you could show 25R was doing something to, to rats and, and uh, so on. But at any rate, I put that all in a paper in in science that got published. That paper really shook things up, and uh, I, I, although I made a lot of friends in the Public Health Service, I didn't make many friends in the Atomic Ener Energy Commission. I had said that strontium-90 would produce leukemia, and no one had ever said that. Of course, uh, that the atomic en head of the Atomic Energy Commission, when asked about this work on radio, said, oh, uh, he's not an expert on, that, on leukemia. So this is the kind of... Uh, thing you ran into in, in those days. The establishment did not want this to be known because it would have interfered with testing bombs. We weren't interested in trying, to, especially to stop bomb testing. Sturdivant, by the way, had started this because he, he said that uh, genetic effects, there'd be no threshold for them, and fallout was a bad thing. And uh, the atomic energy people jumped all over him, and he was on a committee that uh, wrote a report. That was a pretty bad mess, too. The Academy had a committee, and although the geneticists were quarreling over that, and I think Jim Crow has written so, something about this, but what happened there is that Sturdivant was horrified when the atomic energy people got um, uh, this mathematician, uh, Warren Weaver was his name. So he said, you write this report, you write a summary for this, and publish that. And the summary essentially said there was no effect uh, that could be attributed to it. It was outrageous. So Sturdivant was furious when he wrote a letter in the New York Times and they didn't publish it. So those were the, those were the days. Mm -hmm. It was really terrible because they were able to manipulate a National Academy committee that way. And uh, just because the geneticists weren't all in a total agreement on everything, they had to bring in some outsider who could set them straight. It was a nasty, dirty game that was involved. Mm -hmm. okay, that went so on for years. <laughs> so the U.S. is doing atmospheric testing of atomic bombs. Mm -hmm. You've shown for yeah. the first time that this is going to cause leukemia, and people yeah. well, who drink milk nationwide because the milk is full of strontium-90. Oh. <laughs> there must have been a hailstorm. What I really did was first get the uh, quantitation of the dose relation to the frequency of leukemia. Mm -hmm. People knew that radiation could produce leukemia, but the linearity and so on had not been so. But what you mentioned about uh, also the milk, uh, 
the milk turned out to have an even more serious problem, namely radioiodine. And that was something that I discovered by talking to the public health people. I knew people in public health. One of them was a, a, a veterinarian, and he knew that cattle concentrated the radioiodine from the grasses. The radioiodine was coming from the Nevada tests all over the Middle West. The cattle would concentrate the radioiodine in their th thyroids, but also in their milk. And so it became quite clear that, that uh, any child who drinks some milk from a cow that's been eating that will get a radioiodine. And what people did not know thyroid. was that the thyroid of an infant is 1 20th of the size of, the, of our thyroid as adults. And the beta rays from the iodine will be totally absorbed in that little organ, so they get 20 times the dose that we do. So I wrote a paper about how they get 20 times the dose and that they get them from the milk and so on. In rare cases, they get 100 times background. That actually came out only a few years ago that about the actual measurements that were being made. At any rate, I, I wrote all this up. I unfortunately sent it to PNAS. Sturdivant submitted it. It should have gone to science because it never made any splash at all. But at any rate, it's, it's sort of interesting to see that that how they tried to cover up everything. And there was never a realization that radioiodine is the main trouble that you run into as a hazard to people following, we'll say, nuclear explosions uh, where the fallout will, will drift onto. And Chernobyl is a perfect example of what has happened there. The children in Belarus have now definitely thyroid cancer-induced I, uh, by the by, the radioiodine that they drank uh, as milk from cows because they didn't have powdered milk and so on. They were using yeah. fresh milk. So, any rate, so now you're right in the middle of a national debate on yeah, right. on, on atomic bomb yeah. testing and yeah. on fallout. Yeah. Did that have any effect on your career on your work? Well, it didn't. Fortunately, because I was at Caltech and you couldn't fire anybody. I was never bothered except that I was told I was, didn't know what I was doing. And uh, <laughs> so that kind of thing is sort of annoying, but I'm not totally paranoid as a result. I think. <laughs> <laughs> but you ended up at one point testifying before Congress. Yes, uh, that was right after I wrote the paper in May of mm -hmm. 1957. So the, the end result is the bomb testing stopped and you played a substantial well, role in that. Well, long time later, unfortunately. but. Kennedy stopped it be, partly because he had a, one of his siblings was a, had a, a genetic defect, and he realized that, that that was close to home, and he understood that if radiation produces genetic defects, we better stop this time. So it was effective, it was in, effective the end. in the end. Now, also in the 1950s, one of your most widely cited papers was published, which is the Drosophila Information Service paper on EMS mutagenesis oh. in flies. Oh, that was, that, that's often true, that the most cited reference would be something where you actually provided the community with a method that works. <laughs> or, uh, we did that uh, in the case of EMS. Actually, EMS was known to be a good mutagen in plants. So I decided to just try to feed the EMS, because I knew about the plant work, by putting it on some Kleenex with sugar water and, and, and get fed it to the flies after starving the flies so they had to eat this stuff, drink this stuff. And it works like a charm. <laughs> by the way, Ed Grell, our, the other graduate student I had, he, he actually injected EMS into, and got enormous mutation rates. But, that's a, pr a more difficult thing, and it was most easy for people to just use this simple feeding technique. And it's been very, it was very valuable. Many people induced mutations that way. And it was ideal to try to get p point mutations. P people, I never, imp well, I guess I'll, I, I have not touched upon the fact that the X-ray mutations are much more violent than these chemical ones. And so we needed both, the X-ray type, and we needed a, a mild mutagen that would just make base pair changes, which EMS does.
Yep. You're responsible for the all the chemical mutagenesis to follow well, in, some in Drosophila. Of, some of it, yes. Yeah. yes put, because put the because uh, uh, of course it started with with Auerbach, who, d who during World War II was working on nitrogen mustards, and they are very mutagenic, but they're incredibly nasty to work with. She was so allergic to them, she couldn't even work with them after a while. Mm. But they were, and they were formaldehyde and very thin. They were not practical. None of them were practical. But the EMS, which, again, in your field of plant work, it, it had first been w very effectively yeah. used. Still what we use. We, we, and, and your other big technical innovation yes. was the fly food recipe. Yes, yes, yes that, was, that was fun, too, because uh, uh, we had too much trouble with molds and putting moldex in, which is toxic. A lot of the work I did would not have been done on some of the media that are around because the flies you want would die uh, on, uh, and not hatch out of the pupae, pupal cases if, uh, if the media hadn't been as good as we were able to develop here, I'm sure of that. And what happened was I found out that propionic acid, which is a nice fungicide, is only effective when in the non-ionized state. So it was clear we had to bring the pH way down. And we tried various acids, and with phosphoric acid really is marvelous because they apparently short of phosphorus in the medium we use. We bring the pH down, we add propionic acid, and then in addition, Bob Wagner had found a yeast in cactus of Arizona that was resistant to propionic acid. So we've cultured that even to today. We still use that and spray on this yeast. So it's a wonderful food. We do kill the fungi with this mixture of acids. Still, it's not perfect because propionic's probably a little bit toxic. But it's far better than all the other methods that add these fungicides and antibiotics and so on that are basically toxic. And so, so that, that without, without creating the new media, you would have been unable to get the genotypes. Some of them, I'm that, sure, uh -huh. have been greatly helped. Especially, you get a very rare fly a crossover and it's a little weak uh, and uh, or mutation doesn't have to be a crossover and uh, unless you've got very good food it won't breed for you so a lot of things were saved that way another element of the technology of Drosophila genetics that we owe to you are our current sets of balancers well that was why, a, why did you make all those how well and they with weren't whom? very good the ones we had that were inherited from the early days like CLB they were pretty bad. They, they didn't hold the link genes together very effectively over the entire chromosome. So, and we fortunately had Rhoda Grell, who was then Rhoda Mislove when she came, and I started her on helping to build these newer balancers. And uh, I was involved in, together with her in making these. They took time out just to make the things and induce them, and you would easily, uh, could easily set up experiments that would uh, select for what you wanted, and we did that for many, many years, and build a whole lot of balancers that are now widely used and are very important, especially where you want to get isogenic stocks and so on, and so, and keep things together that were always falling apart, and somebody had to constantly work on the stocks to keep them from breaking down. So that was a, that was a nice, uh, thing for the community, I think, that we did. Of course, we kept the stock centers going when they were sort of a being abandoned when Demerits sort of wanted to give it up because Drosophila genetics was dead. Who would want to work with that? That was a common feeling. Everybody had gone into, into prokaryotic genetics. But it didn't bother me particularly because you know, I have such a love for fruit flies, I wouldn't give them up for any E. coli, all the <laughs> E. coli in the world. <laughs> okay, and so through all this technology yeah. development, atomic bombs, you're still working yes. on bithorax. Yes, still working on, yes, all the time. I, I, I guess what was exciting was to discover that uh, uh, when you looked at embryos, I happened to look at an embryo that was lacking all of the, uh, we'd knocked out all the genes of the, complex uh, by just x-rays making a mutation that, uh, that produced the so-called ultra-bithorax effect, but it was, it was a mutation that took everything out. We didn't know it at the time, but when you looked at the embryo, it didn't have any of the cetal belts or anything that the fly is supposed to have. 
and it had funny sense organs that were only normally on the thorax. So, and I think we realized then that this was analogous to what had been found in the silkworm, that they had larvae of the silkworm that had mutations that they could see. And sure enough, in Drosophila, you can see the phenotypes that we had been looking at in the larva. I think even before we looked at the embryo, I'm sure of this, we found that the spiracles were re being reduplicated in an, in an animal that was homozygous for the ultrabithorax mutation. They had three sets of anterior spiracles instead of one. It was spectacular. But when we looked at the absence of all the genes, then we discovered that all the body segments were affected. And then we fortunately had some duplications that we'd already, we'd had a lot of x-ray stuff. And we could add back to the deficiency for the whole set of genes we call the bithorax complex, parts of the complex. So this was something new that I think nobody had ever done before. Namely, you used to have to try to deduce the function of a gene by taking a mutation that knocked it out and saying, ah, that means the normal is doing this. But in this case, we knocked everything out and we added the normal back. And mm -hmm. you can see that the normal was able to restore parts of the structures of a segment that were missing when you didn't have it. So it was, a, it was a very nice trick to be able to add these duplications. You can't do everything because for some reason these, this complex is polarized. If you knock something out at one part, it, it in, inactivates things beyond it. So, and that's still not very well understood, not really understood. Uh, so at any rate, it was a matter of getting a good mutations accumulated that, that we had done over the many, many years. So, so we're still using these. So you had all the strains you'd made to study pseudoallelism, <coughs> and now there's a developmental angle. About when yeah. did this shift yeah. occur, or the recognition? I think it shifted when we found that you could work with the embryo. Mm -hmm. That was that was it. And that about when was that? We published in what 70, 78. Eight, I think was the, the Nature paper. Nature paper. How so long? By, about no, 75, no. Yeah. we were talking about, we were beginning to see these embryonic effects. Much, much earlier, we had saw, seen the larval effects. They go back to 1951, where we mm -hmm. published uh, what they were doing. But at any rate, the larval phenotype <clears throat> is really spectacular. The, the embryonic phenotype as it hatches into a larva. It's the end of embryonic larva development. You have to dissect mm -hmm. the... Uh, the little eggshells off, and then uh, there is a, a, a an embryo. Often the deficiency P9, they can't even hatch; they're paralyzed. Mm -hmm. So we had to open the egg and spread them out, and they developed a very simple technique of putting them in a drop of lactic acid with a little alcohol in it, and that clears them, takes out all their tissue, and you get a nice uh, uh, flat skin of the of the first instar larva, actually, and you can look at all of the structures. And you can almost read the phenotype of the, of the adult uh, at this stage. And in fact, it's better. You can see effects that you can't even see in the adult at this time. So it was a real revelation, and that's the basis for the pictures that are in the Nature paper. And we had some scanning EM pictures that were beautifully taken by one of the, our technicians. And all in all, it, was, uh, it made a lot of sense. Uh, once we could look at the skin of the embryo, that uh, the mature cuticle, as we call it, because it uh, uh, confirmed everything that we had thought about how it was controlling development. So from then on, Development w was the was the big issue, but I. The main issue is all we were interested in was studying how you got new genes from old genes, mm -hmm. and suddenly it had application to embryology, into development, and so Drosophila from then on, became a great organism for embryology, and simultaneously I think virtually independently, Yanni Nusslein, Volder, and Vishas were looking at these embryos, for for lethal mutations that produce pattern changes that they finally interpreted as 
polarity mutants and so on and so on. It was a revolution to use the Drosophila embryo to study essentially embryology. So here it is, it's 1978, you've just revolutionized the use of Drosophila for embryology and also with the movies you've been making proposing what's now called evolutionary developmental biology, Evo Devo. When mm. did yeah. you start making your famous movies of segments changing in evolution? Yeah, we, I spent many years at that. It was the outcome of a giving a Beck, uh, Watson lecture and refined it. I spent a lot of time working on learning how to do moving, moving picture stuff and going to Hollywood where, where you would take the film and they would uh, wash the films and, and print them and do all kinds of fancy stuff. That was quite exciting and time consuming. We did animation. And uh, it was a lot of fun. That movie brought to a lot of people <laughs> the yeah. relation between yeah. developmental genetics and evolution. And, and it showed the flies walking around, too, that had all these mutations. Uh, I know a lot of people that, uh, wouldn't have realized what Drosophila was like without seeing, seeing these. By the way, some of the things, like the four-winged fly, I, there's still people who think that I just selected uh, the flies that had the extreme phenotype. It isn't the case at all, we can produce these and every fly will have the four-winged phenotype. Unfortunately, we're still trying to get more muscle development. We're working on that now. But it takes some more genes to get them to have muscles. So eventually, someday, we hope to have them take off. And so what about coworkers? You mentioned two graduate students, yep. you and Grail. Were those yep. the only two graduate <coughs> students of your career? Uh, don't forget Burke Judd. Ah, and Burke, Burke Judd did Burke this student. wonderful experiment yeah. where he proved that Frucci and Sutton's hypothesis was wrong, that uh, in heterochromatin variegation, what was happening is heterochromatin in one chromosome was, was exerting its forces on the, on the homologous chromosome. They had a protein, gene protein idea at that time. It was before DNA. Well, he showed that you could, by essentially a kind of cis-trans test, he could prove that the effect of heterochromatin is in cis on the wild type allele of white and mm -hmm. not in trans, forever demolished that idea. It's mm -hmm. still resurrected by some people for, for dominance of b brown, but I won't get into that because it, I think that's wrong too. So Judd was your student or Sturdivant's student? Yeah, he or was or my student. Sturdivant used to say that Lin we were sharing Lindsley, but he really worked with not only Sturdivant, but with Nowitzki, mm -hmm. who was here on a postdoc for a while uh, before he went to, uh, to Oak Ridge. And so they got a lot out of working, I think Lindsley did, from working with Nowitzki. Because uh, Sturdivant left you alone, you were allowed to free mm -hmm. freedom complete. So student. three graduate students yeah, in right, your career. Right, yeah. I discourage people from working. I, it was a time of biochemical genetics, and I urged them to go into biochemical and other fields. I'd, I thought maybe there wouldn't be any jobs for people in Drosophila, and there probably wouldn't have been if it hadn't been for the later interest in development. It was getting to be a dead-end field. Most of the good ideas about inheritance of inversions and things had all been worked out. So that was the reason that I didn't have more, and I never asked grant money for postdocs. That's another reason. If you do that, then you you bring people in because you have to spend the money and th so on. And even if I tried, I never could get funded for anything very well. Uh, NIH and NSF, every year they, uh, they were complaining, they had to cut back. and You couldn't add very much. You'd get a 5 or 10 percent increase once in a while. But it was always a struggle. We had a stock center and they wouldn't increase the amount of money for that uh, beyond what, because we started with nothing <laughs> practically. <laughs> So, at any rate, but granting fund gotten in, got, got more. But in the beginning, we didn't have all that hassle with grants. ONR and AEC gave us money without too much of a hassle. So even though you were criticizing the AEC, they were yeah. still funding you. They, they funded us and didn't, you know. They wanted uh -huh. me to work on some things that I didn't want to work on, so I did, and I didn't. They wanted this, this neutron work, and I did that. It was sort of interesting. Gave me a chance to use the transvection method. And the, mm -hmm. It was sort of fun. Yeah. And so uh, all these experiments you did yourself, almost all. I know you number your uh, crosses in your notebooks. Yeah. What, what number are you up to? 
53,000 today. So <laughs> now sometimes a, a f one number would have 100 cultures with the same number. So I, it's probably uh, hundreds of thousands. But I forgot to mention what a strong influence Beetle was. I did mention how he took the flies, but Beetle was a great influence because he, he brought down from Stanford when he came down to uh, my future wife, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Pam Lewis, uh, we knew each other a few months and, and got married. Uh, and she turned out to find polycomb, one of the most important mutations. She worked for a while with Sturdivant. And then, of course, we started having children. And, and she p prefers to do artwork to science, but it's too bad because she's a very great scientist. But at any rate, uh, she um, prefers the artistic life and has done many Many of our posters, of course, are oh, well yeah. known. Uh -huh. That she did mainly for many for our children are are now used for our some of our symposia. So Beetle was responsible <laughs> indirectly for that. But Beetle was a great chairman and really uh, at a wonderful period when science was beginning to take off as a result of Sputnik, and he he kept everybody happy and here and it was a it was a very good period when everybody pretty much interacted uh because we weren't too big yet and uh, mm -hmm. and so uh and then he uh uh had a lot of influence by going to Washington and serving on various committees he built up this division from nothing really mm -hmm. because uh but it was due to the wonderful support we got from finally from NIH and NSF. So what do you see at the moment as the big issues in bithorax, the things that, that cross <coughs> 53,000 was on? Well, I'd like to see RNAs uh, be Im an important part of the whole system of why we're getting transvection, why we're getting the polar effects that we get. And that's a wide open field. Uh, nobody is uh, able yet to study that except RNAi is something that may be related. And so we're hoping that that part will be understood. And I keep up some of the radiation stuff right now, too. I'm still working on that, some of that. Mm -hmm. So one of the themes in your life has been Scandinavia. And I know that you did a sabbatical in Copenhagen in the 1970s and that your brother lived there. Yes. I first went to Copenhagen was to visit, visit him and his family in the lab there. But then much later, they invited me back many years later uh, for a sabbatical, which I took. Unfortunately, Westergaard, who uh, had been here and worked on Y chromosomes in Melandrium, Melandrium. Melandrium. Yeah. Uh, he uh, died just before I went there. But it was a great, a great year in many ways. Uh, and I began making diagrams of the development of the adult segments illustrating the bithorax system at that time, but it was still before we had the embryonic stuff going. Okay, so 25 or 20 years later, right. the, the king of Sweden gives you oh. the Nobel Prize. Oh, yes, that's true. Uh, that, that's a strange experience. It's a, it's a great uh, experience to go there and receive the prize. Uh, and uh, of course, it was, it's rather strange in that you know you don't get the prize unless you win a few other prizes. So I had won, I think, first a Gardner, and then, and then I'd won the Wolf Prize and several others. But it did happen finally when we were arriving in a meeting place in in Ascona, Switzerland. Uh, I got out of a taxi cab there with Pam and I, and the woman in charge of the meeting that Gehring had arranged said was all excited, which she always is, and then she whispers in my ear, you won the prize. <laughs> so that was how I found out about it. So did the Nobel Prize change your life much? It did for a couple of years. It's hard, and it's still a little bit hard to avoid uh, <laughs> uh, interviews. But this seemed important, so I decided that I'd agree to one more interview. So there's your life in science. There's the family, which you've mentioned. What about the flute? Oh, well. Got you to college. I was annoyed this morning. I didn't have time to play before we set up this interview. I usually try to play five minutes mm -hmm. before uh, every morning or sometimes more. 
reason is I do keep up with some uh, chamber music groups in La Jolla, so you have to keep in practice. Uh, and so if you play every day, it's, it's easier. And you have to keep your lip in shape. And I started mm -hmm. at the age of 10 when my uncle gave me, gave me a flute that, that he had, a wonderful wooden flute, a very good one actually. His wife wouldn't let him play, so he g gave it to me. And so I took off with that, and it was a lot of fun. I don't have a good understanding of, of music, but I like to play. I don't understand the theory or the harmony, because I only play this one line. You, I never learned to play the piano, and so I don't know. But at any rate, uh, it's a lot of fun, and it requires, I think it's training in genetics in the sense that it's a symbolic subject, just as genetics is. I think abstract is what I like to think uh, genetics is.